Section 13 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan Hazelrig. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 13. Lord's Day, the ninth. The Lord assisted me in my public exercises both morning and night, and going to church today, as usual, I heard a stranger preach. But he was a workman that needed to be ashamed. Attended Mr. P. on Monday, and found him very affectionate. The elders of the French church wept over him with much tenderness. Several friends, with myself, conducted him across the river. Then, after singing a parting hymn, he prayed very feelingly, and we took our leave of each other. I afterward went to preach in the swamp, where we had many people and a good time. Tuesday, the 11th. Last night my soul was greatly troubled for want of a closer walk with God. Lord, how long shall I mourn and pray? and not experience all that my soul longeth for. And this day my mind is in nearly the same frame. Wednesday, the twelfth. The Lord blessed me with great peace. I am brought a letter from New Rochelle, containing an agreeable account of the work of God there. With much enlargement of heart, I preached tonight from First Kings 19. 11, and hope it was made a blessing to many present. Thursday, the 13th. My soul is not so intensely stayed on God as it might be. Oh, that he would bring me nearer to himself, and so transform me into his divine likeness, that there may be no diversity of will, but that it may be my meat and drink to promote his glory from moment to moment in all I do. I had much company in the course of this day. Friday, the 14th. My heart was much devoted to God, but having been here now four months, preaching or exhorting every day, and twice on the Lord's Day, besides society meetings, it seemed to be too much for both the people and the preacher. We have now more unity in the society here than we have had for some time past. But we want more of the life and power of religion amongst us. Lord's Day, the 16th. Yesterday Satan assaulted me powerfully, but the Lord was my keeper, so that I may with great propriety adopt the language of the poet. In all my temptations he keeps me to prove his utmost salvation, his fullness of love. This day the Spirit of Grace assisted me in my public exercises. Mr. S. T., once a silversmith of this city, preached a good sermon at church, though his voice was so low that he could scarce be heard. Monday, the 17th. Many people attended preaching in the swamp and my soul was greatly blessed in the discharge of my duty. But, oh, my heart is bowed down within me, and I feel strongly determined to be more watchful and diligent in pleasing God. Tuesday, the 18th. My heart was much taken up with God. I drank tea this afternoon with an old Moravian, who belonged to the fraternity in Fetter Lane, at the time when Mr. Wesley was so intimate with them. Wednesday, the 19th. Captain W. informed me by letter the house in Baltimore was so far finished that he had preached in it. With great liberty and satisfaction, I both met class and preached in the evening, and feel more encouragement to hope for the people here. Thursday, the 20th. Notwithstanding all my grievous temptations, God is still the object of my faith, my hope, my love, my joy. Oh, that he may fill me always with filial fear, 
and give me grace to die to all but him. My soul abounds with sweet peace, and an exhortation which I gave this evening was made a blessing, I trust, to several that heard it. Friday, the 21st. A solemn, comfortable sense of God rested on my mind, and he has kept me from what I hate. And though Satan made some attempts upon my soul, yet the Lord gave me power to withstand him. The next day we had a refreshing time in band meeting. Lord's Day, the 23rd. Dr. M. from D. preached today at church on fellowship with God. He spoke well on that subject, as far as it relates to the fruits and effects of the Spirit, but was deficient in respect to the witness, supposing that some may be in favor with God and not know it. Our carnal hearts are too prone to draw destructive conclusions from such a doctrine as his. Dr. O, as usual, made a mighty clutter in the pulpit about Noah's Ark. Our congregation was large, and we were not left without a blessing. Monday, the 24th. I still look to Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, and trust in him for supplies of strength and consolation. But, oh, when shall my attention be so fixed that nothing may divert it a single moment from its beloved object? We are informed that three of our preachers are coming over from England and that we may look for them every day. Tuesday, the 25th. This morning my spirit wrestled with principalities and powers, but in the duty of prayer the Lord delivered me. After preaching at night from Matthew 24, 12, a man from Morristown came to me to inquire into my principles and told me the Lord was bringing souls to himself in his neighborhood and that more than 100 were converted there. Wednesday, the 26th. My soul is in peace, but longs to be more spiritual. After meeting a class and preaching in the evening, I found myself indisposed with a cold and fever. The next day my disorder continued, attended with a sore throat, so that it was with difficulty and pain I spoke to the people. Friday, the 28th. I do not sufficiently love God nor live by faith in the suburbs of heaven. This gives me more concern than the want of health. Tis worse than death my God to love, and not my God alone. I was not able to preach, and was obliged to go to bed early, but could not sleep. On Saturday, as my disorder continued, I felt a strong desire for more patience. Mr. J., his wife and daughter, are all very ill, brought on chiefly through fatigue. Lord's Day, the 30th. I kept close house till evening, and oh, what happiness did my soul enjoy with God! So open and delightful was the intercourse between God and my soul that it gave me grief if any person came into my room to disturb my sweet communion with the Blessed Father and the Son. When my work is done, may I enter into that fullness of joy which shall never be interrupted in the blissful realms above. In the evening I ventured to preach from 1 Corinthians 1, 21, and spoke with a great freedom and plainness, and felt better afterward than could have been expected. Found myself something better on Monday, and met two classes. Tuesday. November 1st. My soul was in a lively frame, and sweetly inclined to live to God, and to do all His holy will. Many people appeared to feel the word, while I preached in the evening from Luke 8:18. 8, Wednesday, the 2nd. My friends in this city concluded to write to Mr. R., requesting that I might continue some time longer in New York, in the country adjacent, supposing it would endanger my life to go into the low countries. But to stay or go, I submit to providence. As my legs, hands, and feet were swollen, it was thought proper to consult a physician, 
who sent me a certain mixture of bitters. Thursday, the third. My mind was much taken up with God, but I must lament that I am not perfectly crucified with Christ. I visited Mr. J., who appeared to be near death, and am ready to say, Art thou he? Oh, how changed! The next morning, about eight o'clock, he died, being about forty-two years of age, leaving a wife and six children behind him. At present a spirit of harmony subsisteth amongst our leaders, but I want to see them also deeply engaged to take the kingdom of heaven by violence. Lord's Day, the sixth. Both my body and mind were afflicted today. In the morning I showed the congregation the danger of settling on their lees, as all do who rest in dead formality or trust in any past experience. In the evening I addressed the people on the heartfelt inquiry of the trembling jailer, What must I do to be saved? Monday, the 7th. My body was weak, and my mind was much tempted. Lord, support and comfort me under every trial. I met the class of Mr. J., deceased, found much love amongst them, and by general consent appointed R.S. to act as their leader. I found much satisfaction in preaching the next evening, but had sore conflicts with Satan in the course of the day. Wednesday, the ninth. My soul is strengthened with might and filled with peace. But I see the propriety and great necessity of living every moment more and more to God. We are informed from Philadelphia that it is eight weeks since the preachers sailed from England, though they are not yet arrived. Friday, the 11th. My heart is grieved, and groaneth for want of more holiness. A letter from E.D. at New Rochelle informs me of a gay young woman, and one or two more, who are turning to God through Christ Jesus. They call aloud for preachers to come amongst them. On Saturday we had a blessed time in band meeting, though my mind had been somewhat depressed by finding one or two of my best friends drawn into a measure of party spirit. Lord's Day, the 13th. Dr. E. at St. Paul's was on his old tedious subject of the Lord's Supper. He cannot be at any great loss in saying the same thing over and over again so frequently. Many people attended at our church in the morning, and in the evening there were about a thousand who seriously listened, while I preached from Psalm 112. Monday, the 14th. I set off for New Rochelle but by the disagreeable gait of the horse was exceedingly wearied on my arrival. Nevertheless, I gave an exhortation to some serious people who were collected there. The next day my mind was troubled by turning on political subjects, which are out of my province. Alas, what a small matter may interrupt our communion with God, and even draw away our affections from Him. Though we had a profitable time, while I preached from Psalm 1, 2. Wednesday, the 16th. I went to P.B.'s, where we had many people in some power. There is a very perceivable alteration in the people of these parts. They both hear and understand, in some measure, the things of God, and can feel His awful truths. I had some conversation with a certain Mr. B., a sensible man, though he is tainted with the indolent spirit of Quakerism. Thursday, the 17th. All my desire was after God, and Him alone. Though my spirit was grieved by some involuntary thoughts which crowded in upon me, but in the midst of all there was a calm and settled peace. Friday, the 18th. Unguarded and trifling conversation has brought on a degree of spiritual deadness. But, by the grace of God, I will rouse myself, and endeavor to be more watchful and spiritual in all my ways, and in all things please him whom my soul loveth far above every other object. Saturday, the 19th. I set off with an intention to go to York, 
but at the bridge was informed that Mr. D. had come to the city. Therefore I returned to Mr. B.'s, and preached twice there the next day, as also once at Mr. D.'s, and am persuaded that the power of God attended the word at both places. We have here a small class of about thirteen persons, most of whom enjoy peace and consolation in Christ Jesus. I met them on Monday, and we were greatly comforted together. Thursday, the 24th. My heart is weaned from visible objects, and, by grace, raised to its best beloved above. But, oh, I greatly long for more solid, lasting union, to be inwardly adorned with all the virtues and graces of evangelical religion. We were this day informed of the death of Mr. O. May the Lord help me to be faithful, lest I should not live out half my days. I set off the next day for New York, and met Brother S. at Kingsbridge. When we got within about ten miles of York, we found that about fifteen minutes before, a man had been robbed of his money and his coat from off his back. One of the rogues pursued us, but we were too far before him. We reached our church just as Mr. D. began to preach. Monday, the 28th. After taking my leave of my good friends in New York the last evening, from Philippians 1, 27, Captain W. and myself set off this morning for Amboy. We met with a person who came a passenger with us from England in the character of a gentleman, by the name of Wilson, but now he calls himself Clarkson, and since then he has called himself Lavingston. He has been apprehended for passing a counterfeit bill, for which he was both imprisoned and whipped. When he saw me, he knew me, and I knew him. But he was in such perplexity that he could eat no breakfast, and went off in the first wagon he could meet with. To what fears and anxiety are poor sinners exposed? And if the presence of a mortal man can strike such terror into the minds of guilty sinners, what must they feel when they stand without a covering before a heart-searching and righteous God? On Tuesday, we arrived at Burlington, very weary, and we were saluted with the melancholy news that two unhappy men were to be hung on the Monday following, one for bestiality and the other for abusing several young girls in the most brutish and shocking manner. Alas, for the dignity of human nature, the next day I visited them, and found one of them, who was a papist, a little attentive. But he wanted to know if he might not trust for pardon after death. The other was a young man who appeared to be quite stupid. Both Captain W. and I spoke freely and largely to them, though there was very little room to hope that we should do them any good. Here Mrs. H. gave an account of the triumphant death of her sister, whose heart the Lord touched about two years ago under my preaching. In preaching this evening, I showed the people the emptiness of mere externals in religion, and the absolute necessity of the inward power and graces thereof. Friday, December 2nd. My soul enjoys great peace, but longs for more of God. We visited the prisoners again, and Captain W. enforced some very alarming truths upon them, though very little fruit of his labor could be seen. Mr. R. came to Burlington today, and desired me to go to Philadelphia. So, after preaching in the evening from Proverb 28.13, I set off the next morning for the city, and found the society in the spirit of love. Lord's Day, the 4th. I preached twice with some freedom, and went to hear Mr. S., but it was the same thing over again. The next day my mind was in a sweet, calm frame, and I felt a strong determination to devote myself wholly to God in His service. I spoke my mind to Mr. R., but we did not agree in judgment, and it appeared to me that to make any attempt to go to Baltimore would be all in vain. Tuesday the sixth. Visited some of my friends in the city, and wrote a letter to Mr. Wesley, which I read to Mr. R., 
that he might see I intended no guile or secret dealings. It is somewhat grievous that he should prevent my going to Baltimore, after being acquainted with my engagements in the importunities of my friends there. However, all things shall work together for good to them that love God. The next day Mr. R. appeared to be very kind. So I hope all things will give place to love. Lord's Day, the 11th. Mr. R. preached a close sermon on the neglect of public worship. At church, Mr. S. had the same thing over again, but the power of the Lord attended our preaching in the evening from 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, and 8. Tuesday, the 13th. Yesterday, my heart was fervently engaged in acts of devotion, and with some enlargement of heart, I gave an exhortation at a private house near my lodging. But today my cry is, Oh, for more spirituality, more purity of heart. Lord, form me by the power of divine grace, according to all thy righteous will, that my soul may enjoy thee in glory forever. Though concurring circumstances required me to speak this evening in a manner unprepared, yet we were blessed with a comfortable season. Wednesday, the 14th. Mr. R. was sick, and Captain W. was busy, so I spent my time in study and devotion, and enjoyed a blessed sense of the Divine Presence. But what need can there be for two preachers here to preach three times a week to about sixty people? On Thursday night about sixty persons attended to hear Captain W. preach. This is indeed a very gloomy prospect, but my heart delighteth in God. He is the object of my hope, and I trust he will be my portion forever. Lord's Day, the 18th. My soul was happy while preaching in the morning. Mr. S. gave us an old piece at church, and Mr. R. was very furious in the evening. Monday, the 19th. My body was indisposed, but my soul enjoyed health. The Lord gives me patience and fills me with his goodness. In meeting Sister T's class we had a mutual blessing. Oh, that I could all invite, his saving truth to prove. Show the length and breadth and height and depth of Jesus' love. Wednesday, the 21st. I began to read Neal's History of the Puritans. The Lord keeps me from all impure desire and makes me to abound with divine peace. In prayer meeting this evening, all present were greatly blessed. Friday, the 23rd. Mr. Neal, in his history, is tolerably impartial, though he seems rather inclined to favor the nonconformists. But how strange that the Reformation should be carried on in such a reign as that of Henry the Eighth, and in time of Edward the Sixth, while he was but a child. The good bishops, no doubt, carried the matter as far as they could, but it was not in their power to disentangle themselves and the nation from all the superstition of popery. But Queen Elizabeth and her friends bore hard for the supremacy. It seems the dispute began at Frankfurt, and Calvin was in the consultation. In the evening I preached from these words, Neither give place to the devil, and believe it was good for some that they were present took my lodging the next day at Mr. W.'s. The next day, as the snow was near two feet deep, I did not go out, but had a comfortable time at home. End of Section 13 Recording by Jordan Hazelrig